Father, we praise you and magnify your name and we lift your name above all names. Because, Lord God, there is nothing greater than the name of Jesus. So, Father, we humble our hearts this morning as we come this Palm Sunday. And, Lord, we declare today that you are faithful. And, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of crisis, you are faithful in all things. So, Father, we come to you this morning. We surrender our hearts. We, we surrender every preconceived notion, idea, fear, worry, an anxious thought and say, Jesus, come and bring your peace. We ask in your name. Amen, church. Amen. Well, welcome to Palm Sunday service online. Who'd have ever thought this would be a possible thing? And what a great time of worship. Amen. You know, if you were all here, I'd say give the worship team a hand and you can feel free to do that in your home if you want. But what, what an opportunity we have to be able to come even in our homes, and be able to worship one with another. You know, it's, it's in this time in our service that we usually do our offering. And, and can I just say that we, we're making everything available to you for giving of your tithes and your offerings. If you go to our website, which is kotod.church, C-O-T-O-D dot church, you'll see that there's a giving tab right there, and you can scroll down to the bottom, and it'll give you all the information that you need there so you can give online. For those of you that are already giving through Tithely, you can continue to do that just fine. And as we've seen this last week, there's a number of people that have just driven to the church and said, I, I don't want to deal with this technology stuff. That's perfectly fine as well. I'm thankful for your faithfulness to continue to honor the Lord and to be able to give. So uh, any way that we can help, church, <clears throat> you let us know how we can help because we've been praying for you. Uh, another thing I'd encourage you to do, maybe you've seen it on Facebook, but uh, we can't gather together right now. But what we did is we put a little uh, notice on Facebook and said, if you'll go to kotod.church and at the bottom you can fill out your name, and then there's a place for a message where you can put your family's names. We're going to print off these uh, three and a half by eight and a half sheets, and we're going to tape your name to the pew. So that way you can join us in spirit if you can't technically be here uh, physically. Also, it gives me something to... To, to see as I'm walking around praying for you. Uh, I, I love you, church, and I miss you, but I, I tell you what, the church is not about the building, amen? The church is about you and me. We are the church. Where you're at in your home right now, in your comfy pajamas maybe, uh, you're, you're the church. You're the church wherever you go in your neighborhood. Uh, we may be quarantining ourselves or taking time to just kind of hang out at, at home, but as you walk through your neighborhood, you are the church. And this Palm Sunday, I thought about Palm Sunday and how Jesus just came. And as he made his triumphal entry, Jesus knew exactly what was going to take place, but the people didn't. Uh, they thought he was coming to be the, the Messiah that would rule and reign and take the oppression off of their back. They didn't know that he was headed towards the cross, but Jesus knew. Yeah, I can only imagine as Jesus went down that road, knowing what was ahead of him, he knew the brokenness that was going to take place. He knew the sacrifice that was going to, to need to be made. Yet he was faithful in all things for you and for me. You know, today, uh, Jesus is still faithful. He knows exactly what's going on, even in this world situation with COVID-19 and all of the anxious thoughts that goes with it. We don't understand it, but he does, and he's still faithful in the middle of this. And I want to talk to you today. <clears throat> We're going to start a series, because we can do that whether it be online or not, called Broken. I think it's very appropriate that we come this Sunday and talk what, about what it means to be broken. And today I want to talk to you about the beauty and brokenness. Because no matter what you go through in life, there's always going to be something good in the broken things that you experience in your life. And I want to start off by talking about how to find the beauty and brokenness. Uh, we can't talk about all of the broken things without understanding first and foremost that there is some beauty in the midst of it. In other words, there's things that we can learn. We'll talk next week about the broken body and how Jesus ha had laid down his life for us. And we'll continue through that series. But as we start today, we must prepare our hearts uh, this Easter service, this Easter uh, season, if you will. And we must stop, especially now, and remind ourselves that the cross tree of Calvary is what binds you and I to Christ Jesus. That's the binding, binding factor. You know, a couple weeks ago, I, I asked you if you knew what an emulsifier was, and I gave an illustration, but 
uh, let, me, let me just explain. If you went to the store and you bought a bottle of Italian dressing, uh, Italian dressing is mostly comprised of, of um, you're going to see oil and you're going to see water in there. And in the Italian bottle dressing, you're going to see the oil rise to the surface and all the stuff's at the bottom, right? And you have to shake that bottle up. And when you shake that bottle up, it starts to combine and it starts to mix to create the dressing that we all want. Uh, but if you leave that bottle alone long enough, it's going to separate once again. They go back to their intrinsic value or their intrinsic nature because water and oil don't mix. In, in mayonnaise, though, mayonnaise, if you look at that, it's basically oil and water as well. But even though it's comprised mostly of oil and water, mayonnaise contains something called an emulsifier, and the emulsifier is the egg. Here's what an emulsifier is. An emulsifier is that which brings two things together that uh, on their own would never come together. Oil and water would never come together, but because of the eggs that are in there, it can now hang out with one another. You see, the egg infiltrates both of them. And let me tell you something. The cross tree of Calvary is the emulsifier that brings you and I into oneness with Jesus Christ. Apart from Jesus Christ, we cannot make it. We will not be able to do it on our own. But because of Jesus Christ, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. You see, now let me take you back to that Palm Sunday when Jesus came in. Jesus knew that his, his substitutionary death, his going to the cross was going to be the one thing that would enable, if you will, um, empower us or give us the rite of passage to be with him for an eternity. And he knew that. We, we didn't. But yet he was faithful in all of that. He understood the brokenness that he was going to have to go through. And yet he did it. Now, when you and I go through brokenness, I'm not saying that it's not real. I'm not saying that we don't experience brokenness. And when we do experience it, it hurts, right? Pain hurts. When you're going through brokenness, it hurts. But what are you supposed to do in the middle of your brokenness? That's what we have to focus on because the world is going to tell you one way, but the Word of God will tell you another. You know, my kids, when they were little, uh, I remember watching them as they went through brokenness in their life and experiencing those first few heartbreaks. You know, when my kids were little, it was, it was over things that we wouldn't even bat an eye at. You know, they had fish in their room, and they loved to have these little fish, but shortly after they had the fish, the fish died for one reason or another. I mean, we just had crazy fish. And, and, but I remember when they, they came home and they found out their fish were dead. They were brokenhearted. They were crushed. They thought, how can this be? It was their first experience of what death was all about. Seth, I remember as a little boy, uh, he couldn't say caterpillar, so it was always calipitter, right? And I remember when he found a calipitter, and he had that, and he thought it was just the coolest thing. But then that thing died, and he was broken. He was crushed. Now, you and I, when we experience brokenness, maybe we're like, man, I wish the pains in this world were as simple as a fish or a caterpillar. But maybe you and I have been going through times where We've had brokenness in our jobs. We've had brokenness in our finances, uh, our, our status, our identity. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you've experienced a loss. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, you're in a place of experiencing this brokenness. You see, brokenness happens when we have our hearts set on something or someone, and it doesn't pan out the way that we thought it should. Things happen a different way. You see, the question in life is simply going to be this. It's not if you will experience brokenness in life, what should you do? But it should be when you experience brokenness in life, what should you do? Because you can't avoid it. Romeo and Juliet, uh, we, we all remember these. If you don't in high school, you're probably going to come across it in your literature class. But it's a classic love story between two young people who could not be together. They were forbidden to marry, so they took drastic measures to end their lives. Now, that's a horrible story in reality. It makes a beautiful story, you know, in literature, but when you don't know how to deal with brokenness in the right way, uh, the truth is, is the, there's, there's the enemy that's there who is always going to have no problem tempting you on other illegitimate ways. You see, Romeo and Juliet may be good dramas for the opera, but it portrays desperate results that don't solve real-life problems. And so what I want to talk to you about today on this Palm Sunday as we prepare for Easter, maybe you're going through brokenness and you're asking this question. As I come to this season, how, do we, how can I find the beauty in the brokenness? I've lost a loved one, or I've lost a job, or <clears throat> I've been battling an illness, or I'm just depressed, or I'm going through a difficult season, and maybe it's not that drastic. Maybe it's just, you know, you're at a season where it's like, 
I don't know, life has changed on you without your permission, and the friends you once had, you don't have right now. Maybe you're preparing for college, and, and you're trying to figure it all out, and in your head, you've got this picture, but in reality, it's working out a different way, and there's a brokenness. What do you do? Well, I want to look at the book of Mark chapter 14, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 9. By the way, if you'd like to follow along with us, you know that I'm an outline kind of a person, so you'll be seeing those on the screen, but also on the website, if you go to, and you can do this later if you want, um, but if you go to kotod.church and you look under the media tab, you'll be able to watch any of these videos and see those, but there's also going to be a sermon note tab under each message, and you'll be able to click on that and download a PDF format. Or you can follow along on version. Just click on the event tab at the bottom and you'll have the whole outline. And you'll have the scripture there, Mark chapter 14. And this is a story about a woman, a familiar one, who came into, into a house where Jesus was and takes something of value, takes something uh, that was important to her, and she allowed there to be a brokenness and she poured out herself in the presence of Jesus. It says in verse 3, I'm being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard, she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some in the room who were indignant among themselves and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a good work for me, for you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But for me, you don't have me with you always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is pre preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Now, I want to back up just a moment and point something out in the scripture, and that's simply this. It says that when she came in and allowed there to be a brokenness and poured herself out, that which was valuable, uh, on the feet of Jesus, what did the others do in the room? They criticized her. You know, it's easy right now with what's going on in our world to criticize leadership, but we must not criticize. We must take the same uh, posture that Jesus had and was to see this brokenness when they criticized her, it says that Jesus said, leave her alone. We must be very careful not to become critical because otherwise all you'll see is perfume or spikenard is what they called it that was poured out and wasted. But what they did not see was a woman who came with brokenness and was preparing the very body of Jesus for his burial. They, they couldn't even see that. You see, there was a beautiful thing in the middle of this story, but the people in the room couldn't see it. So Jesus had to point that out. Maybe today, when you look around, you don't see what it is that Jesus sees. Can I tell you this morning? He's ready and waiting to, to point that out to you, to show you, to lead you through the brokenness of your life so you can see which is that which is beautiful. But how do you do that? I'm going to give you four things real quick that you and I can focus on today. The first one is this. When it comes to brokenness, don't fear it. Brokenness. Don't fear it. A lot of us are afraid to let ourselves be real with Jesus and real with others. Now, I get it. Sometimes we're afraid to be real with others because we're afraid they're going to do like the people in the room did with this woman. They're going to be critical. But when you are real with Jesus, it says that he sees you in your point of brokenness. We're going to share a lot of scripture today uh, because I, I want us to be able to understand just uh, what Jesus has to say about these moments in life. But he says, how, number one, how do you see in the midst of your brokenness beautiful things? He says, for starters, don't fear brokenness, okay? Come to Jesus and let, let yourself be poured out before him. Each and every one of us are going to go through many broken experiences in our lives. We're going to face trials. We're going to go through times of crisis and face chaos. But here's what Jesus says, 2 Timothy 1.7. We've said this verse plenty of times in the last few weeks, and you can probably quote it with me. God has not given us a spirit of fear. But what? Do you remember the rest? It, he's given you a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. That's what Jesus gives. So he says, don't be afraid. Don't fear. Don't you think that when the lady came into this room, now this lady, when she brought in that valuable spike nerd, it was, it was expensive. 
It was like a, a year's worth of salary, and she poured that out. That's why people criticized her, said you could have used the money for something better. There's always going to be somebody that is ready to criticize you for doing the thing that the Lord has placed on your heart. The most important thing is, is to obey the Lord. Don't you think this lady was afraid, though, to come into the room and, 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 and uh, uh, pour this out before Jesus? Don't you think she was afraid of breaking that vial and, and pouring it on Jesus' feet? Don't you think she was afraid of what the people in the room were going to say? Or maybe even afraid of what Jesus might think of her? She had to be afraid. And when she was facing this broken area in her life, there, there, there could have been a fear that held her back. And when you and I face those moments, we can have that same fear that tries to hold us back. But God knew this. He knew that she was afraid. God knew this, and that's why Jesus came. He says that the woman who came was preparing his body. And Jesus says, I have come, Jesus has come, to prepare a way to make a path for you and for me. Here's what it says in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. It says, The Spirit of the Lord, of, uh, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. And here it is. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. The very reason Jesus came was because he knew it was for people with broken hearts. We all experience that brokenness. He says, I know that a broken heart is part of the human experience. So I've come to help you. I've come so that I can be there with you and heal your heart. God understands what it means to have a broken heart. And it doesn't matter what age you're at, whether you're 8, 18, 38, 88, or 188. God knows what it means to walk through a broken heart. Psalms 51, verse 17 says this. And if you're at home and you do have these outlines, feel free to read along with me, okay? Read out loud and let it, just let it go. Here, are you ready? Go. A broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. See, there's three important things to remember. And this is all under don't fear, okay? I told you I was going to give you four things. But this is just three little sub things under number one to not be afraid. Three important things to remember when you go through a broken heart, especially when it first happens and you hit rock bottom and you're experiencing that pain. Uh, maybe it's you feel abandoned. Maybe you're feeling uh, depressed. Here's the first thing you got to remember. God cares, okay? Get that sealed in your heart. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. God cares. As you go through a broken heart, you must know that he cares about your broken heart. When you experience a broken heart, um, you, you've got to understand God is there with you. There's something that God can do about it. Remember that God is with you during these hard times. Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to those who have what? Who have a broken heart and saves such as who have a contrite spirit. God cares about every broken heart. And he saves those who have, in some translations, it says, a crushed heart spirit. Have you ever had your spirit crushed and you feel like there's nobody there to help you? It says that he's right there with you, suffering through your pain and giving you ways to heal you. In your time of despair, know that he cares. God cares very much. And then understand this, that Jesus understands. God cares and Jesus understands. Jesus understands brokenness. He himself experienced brokenness. He had a broken heart many times during his ministry while he was here on earth. Jesus can identify with that. Lazarus in the Bible, if you remember Lazarus, uh, Lazarus was just a good friend. Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Jesus, there was a good friendship. And Lazarus was very dear to Jesus. And when Lazarus died and the family was there, they were full of sorrow. And when Jesus saw Mary and Martha and they were weeping, he too was struck with emotion. He understands what it means to feel the brokenness. And in one of the shortest verses in the Bible, John chapter 11, verse 35, it says two words, Jesus wept. You see, Jesus understands. God cares. And Jesus understands because he came down to be with us in, in, in flesh and blood and understand what it means to experience every emotion. And Jesus was overcome by emotion. And those who witnessed him weeping said, look at him. Don't, Look at how much he must, must have loved Lazarus. You see, Jesus understands. He knew that part of loving people would include getting your heart broken. So God cares, Jesus understands, and then let her see, if you will, God is greater than your heart. 
God is greater than your heart, than my heart. Something, sorry, sometimes in the midst of brokenness, you may feel like there's no hope. Have you ever felt that way? You just feel like there's no hope. All hope is lost. It seems like life is crashing down. It's caving in around you. You feel the crushing of your heart under the weight of the load of despair. And although the feeling may be true, that feeling is not really the greatest truth that there is, not according to the Word of God. You see, if you have Jesus in your heart and you have Jesus in your life, though the world can weigh down on you, you have something on the inside of you that's greater. But if you don't have Jesus in your heart, all you're left with is the weight of the world that crushes you. Another reason to have Jesus in your life. Here's what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. It says, For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts, and He knows all things. The Bible says, Your heart may feel like there's no way out, but remember this, God is greater than your heart, and He knows all things. Even when you can't trust yourself to put the pieces back together, you can trust God to put the pieces back together. So don't be afraid in your brokenness to come to Jesus because God cares, Jesus understands, and he underst understands our hearts better than we do. You see, each of us, we learn to respond to brokenness in many different ways, but the two main types or the two main ways that we respond when we're broken is one way people respond is they harden their heart. Uh, people, they do this to protect themselves from further heartbreak is what they do. But the results aren't very promising when you harden your heart. You become insensitive. You become unemotional. You may have a danger of becoming heartless. Uh, another way people respond is sometimes if they're not hardening their heart, uh, sometimes people, what they'll do is they'll just choose to become uninvolved and they'll remove themselves from people. They'll remove themselves from circumstances or relationships, if you will. But the problem with that is, is you start to laugh less. You celebrate less. You don't enjoy life. You're alive, but you're not really any longer living. See, there's one thing we've got to remember. I put this little bullet in your outline so you can write this down. If you want to be a person after God's own heart, you ready for this? You must risk having your heart broken. If you want to be a person just like Jesus, you must risk having your heart broken. Paul says it this way. It's in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being comforted to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. In other words, Paul was saying simply this. Paul wanted to have his heart break over the same thing that was breaking the Lord's heart. Paul wanted his heart to break for the right reason. Uh, but Paul also wanted to celebrate the things that Jesus was celebrating. Paul understood that when we share in these things, these sufferings with Jesus, we can also understand or celebrate uh, or understand his heart in celebrating things, but we must understand the full heart of Jesus. In other words, be willing to take a risk. That's part of life. In your outline, there's another little bullet. Write this down. Here's what God needs. God needs people to steward his tears more than he does his blessings. How many of you are ready to steward the blessings of God? Well, we'd all say amen. Raise both hands and a foot, right? Because we want to steward the blessings of God, but Jesus, he needs us to steward the tears just as much, if not more. We've got to steward well. Why? Because it's in the brokenness that we can find some beautiful things. God wants us to be good stewards and not be afraid. Not only in the mountaintop experiences, but in the valley times as well. You see, that's the heart of Jesus. He said, the anointing of the Lord is upon me because I have come to bind up the broken hearted. And he needs other people to share his heart in the valleys of life as well as in the mountaintops. He needs someone who will follow him into the areas where there is brokenness and those who are crushed in spirit. Remember, church, we're on the front line. We are the church. And when there's a fire, we're called to run to the fire, not away from it. We're called to assess the situation and figure out how to address it from a kingdom perspective, not from a worldly perspective. But that starts with not being afraid. Do not fear. You know, 
God is desperately searching for people who will steward his tears well. In Luke 9, 23, it says, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. God is so looking for people that will steward well his blessings and his tears. And we, 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 he, when he finds those people, he says, now that, that's a person after God's own heart. In verse 3, it says that the woman that came into the room, it says that she came in and she broke the flask and she then anointed Jesus. Uh, let me just, I don't want to go real deep here, but let me just ask you, when did the brokenness come? Let me say it again. She came into the room, she broke the flask and anointed his feet. When did the anointing come? The anointing came after the brokenness came. The brokenness came first, then the anointing. Sometimes in our brokenness, there's a fresh new anointing that God will bring. But he's not going to bring that until you're willing to walk through some broken areas of your life. Be willing to face some things and see things the way Jesus sees them. You see, if we become afraid to face the brokenness, we may just miss out on the anointing that God wants to bring into our lives. So when facing brokenness, what's the first thing to learn? Don't be afraid of the brokenness. Here's number two. Write this down. Let your brokenness draw you close to God. Let it draw you close to God. Psalms chapter 62, verse 8 says this, Trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. I love that word trust, and I'd love to tell you that from, from out of the womb, I've been the most trustworthy person, but I have not. But here's one of the greatest things I've learned. In all of my brokenness, from the time I was a kid up until this point, and I'm continually learning this, that trust is something you develop and you work on. But it, the way that I worked on it wasn't from the high points in my life. It was from the broken places. I had to make a choice. Am I going to lean into myself or lean into God? And when I chose to lean into God, with all of my brokenness, with all of my garbage, God took that because I was willing to lean into him. And he was willing to develop and, and redeem something in the middle of that. You see, when brokenness happens, you and I must let it draw us close to God. Pour out your heart to him. Let him become a much needed refuge. You see, your heart will break regardless in this life. No matter what you're going through, your heart will break. Just don't let it break and fall in the direction of the enemy or in the direction of the world. Uh, because the world's way is the enemy's way. And their purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy, right? You and I, rather, should let our hearts, when they do break, lean into God and fall his direction because he has a plan and he, he understands and he cares. And his, remember, his, his heart is greater than, than ours. And he's the one who can protect us. You know, let me take you back to the story for just a minute. I'm sure this lady in the Bible, when she walked into the room, I'm sure this lady had a choice before she walked in. Do I walk in? Don't I? Uh, I'm sure she felt on her heart. This is, this is something that was placed upon her heart to do. And she had to look at that value and say, should I do it or shouldn't I? Should I give this or, or, or should I keep it for myself? Should, are, are people going to criticize me or am I more concerned about what I feel like is on my heart and, and, and I honor Jesus with this? I'm sure she had a, had a choice. And I, I, I'm sure she had some things in her life that she struggled with. I'm sure she wasn't perfect. I'm sure she had some addictions or some things in her closet that uh, she was not a perfect lady. Why am I pointing that out? Because I have a feeling that some of us feel we can't come to Jesus and pour ourselves out before him until we become perfect. But if you're going to wait till you're perfect before you pour yourself out to Jesus, it's probably never going to happen. Can I encourage you instead, in your brokenness and in all of the, the yuck of your life, lean into Jesus and watch how he'll redeem it. This woman, I'm sure that, that, that though she had a choice, uh, her actions were going to determine the outcome. Would she become bitter or would she become better? And when she made the choice that she wanted nothing less than to be in the presence of Jesus, that's when God started to redeem her, redeem her. You see, you can choose to become one of two things in life. You can become bitter or you can become better. And if you fall onto the side of the enemy, you surely will become bitter. But if you let your heart break on the right side in the direction of God, he'll heal you and he'll He'll keep you. He'll redeem you. And that which was meant for evil, 
God will turn it for good. I don't know what you're going through today, but in the middle of your brokenness, no, how, no matter how deep or how severe it is or how little it is, broken is broken, amen? And pain is pain, right? And God says he will redeem all of it. You know, in my own life, I noticed that the times that I've grown the most are, are the times I've struggled the most. I, I don't know about you, but I would be willing to, to guess that that would be true for you. If you're honest with the Lord and if you're willing to let him lead you and you're going to lean into the Lord, then you grow m most in the, in the difficult times. It's easy to grow in the mountaintop experiences, but, but that's usually because we're celebrating, right, and having a good time. But it's in the valleys when we're crying out to the Lord and we're saying, God, I need to see you move. I need you more than anything else, and God is faithful. And he shows up in those moments. Uh, I remember, and I shared this illustration probably two, three weeks ago, but I love to play tennis, and, and obviously we can't play it right now. But each week when I would go down and play, there's always somebody better than me, all right? And I, I, let me tell you something in life. There's always going to be somebody better than you, okay? Get over yourself. I have to get over myself. There's always going to be somebody better. The question is, is do you learn when you face those situations? When I went down to play tennis, I enjoyed playing so much, and, and I enjoy the, the men and the women down there that I play with, and some of them are just better than me. And, and when I play them, I think, oh, no, this is going to be difficult, but I had to change my thinking, and here's what I do now. Anytime somebody's better than me, I don't care because it's not about winning and losing anymore. Now, don't get me wrong. I like to win, okay? But when I look at those situations, I realize something. When I play somebody better than me, they always challenge me, and they always push me to be better. I became a better person because of the struggle that I faced to cross the net. I'm now a better player. You and I, when we're going through brokenness, if you will lean into Jesus and not be afraid, you will find out that in the middle of your struggles, you will become better. You will become healthier. You will become whole because God will redeem them because you are leaning into him. Here's what we have to understand. In your outline, there's a little bullet. You can write this down. Suffering will change you, but not necessarily for the better. Here's, here's the ending. You must choose that. Life is always going to throw challenges your way. Suffering uh, may change you, and it's not always going to be for the best, but it can be when you choose it. Will you become better, or will you become bitter? Well, that's what I'm asking you this morning, because the choice is always yours. You see, when my heart gets broken, I tend to feel like everyone is abandoning me. I feel very much like I'm alone. Sometimes you can feel desperate in those seasons. And whenever I experience these feelings, that's when I realize I need to recalibrate my heart back to God. i got to fine-tune that compass, so to speak, to true north. And true north is what the Word of God has to say. You see, it should always come back to Jesus and his word because really that's what makes all the difference in the world. Everything else in my life is simply a gift. What matters most is Jesus and his word. There are times in, in seasons in life like we are right now when your heart must be brought back to the Lord. Can, can I just pause for a moment and say as we're going through this season through COVID-19, um, it is a real thing. And we must use wisdom. But we must make sure in this season to calibrate to what's most important. It's the Word of God. And he says that we must not be afraid. We must use wisdom, but don't fear. In seasons like this, our hearts must be brought back to God. Because Jesus is the answer. In your outline, write this down. I put a little bullet. If you have everything and you don't have Jesus, then you have nothing. But if you have nothing by the world's standard and all you have is Jesus, then you have everything you need. You see, when brokenness happens, and it will in life, let every heartbreak draw you closer to God, and then you'll be ready for the next critical step, which is this. Number three, write this down. What do I do when I'm facing a broken heart? Number three, let God be the one that heals your heart. Let God be the one that heals your heart. Why do, why do you say that? Because too many times we're looking to the world, to heal our heart. Maybe we're not consciously making that decision. Maybe we're not saying, hey, I'm going to see what everyone else has to say, but too many times we let the world be the one that brings comfort or peace or joy or happiness when it should be God because it's the only thing that can sustain us. So let God be the one that heals your heart. Think about this with me. The, 
the woman, when she came into the house, she wasn't entering the house uh, just because she had nothing else to do, right? Uh, she wasn't pouring out her most valuable possession because she had nothing better to do. She, she, she just felt like it. She was pouring out her heart. She was pouring out her life before her Savior and thus saying this, above all else, I want you, Jesus. I want you. I want nothing more than to be in your presence and know that I'm doing the thing that you told me to do. You see, her heart was broken at that point. And it's at this point that she wasn't concerned about what everyone in the room said. She wasn't concerned about what her community said. What she was most concerned with is what Jesus had to say. That's why you and I, when it comes to understanding our times of brokenness, we must let God be the one that is, is healing our heart. As a matter of fact, God has a lot to say about healing broken hearts. Let me share a few with you. Psalms chapter 147, verse 3. Now remember, yeah, I'm going to share with you three verses. Read along with me, okay? You can do this in your homes. This is how we be the church. So here's Psalms 147, verse 3. You ready? Go. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That's, that's Jesus. That's God. Exodus chapter 15, 26. He's speaking to the children of Israel. Here, ready? Go. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right, because they sometimes didn't, he said, for I am the Lord who heals you. Now, I jumped from the beginning to the end of the verse because he's saying, if you will listen to my voice, he says, I will heal you. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 14 says, heal me, O Lord, and I shall be what? I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. God is saying this. He's saying, I'm greater than your heart. I can heal you. I have come to bind up the brokenhearted, and I will be close to those who are crushed in spirit. Now, he's not saying that he's not close to you if you're not crushed in spirit. He's saying, I'm always, I never leave you. I never forsake you. But when you're crushed in spirit, he says, I'm closer than you would ever believe. If you miss everything else, though, catch this right here and write this down in your outline if you don't let god heal your broken heart you can develop a broken spirit please hear that if you don't let god heal your broken heart you can develop a broken spirit and there's a big difference between having a broken heart and having a broken spirit huge difference actually we can handle a broken heart right but a broken spirit takes the wind out of your sails uh, a broken spirit takes the wind of the spirit out of your relationship with God. And, and when someone chooses to be a victim with a broken spirit, they give up. Uh, they stop living. Uh, the Bible has something to say about that in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 4. Read it with me at home. Okay, you ready? Go. The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, it says, but who can bear a broken spirit? Who can bear a broken spirit? God says a broken spirit is devastating. Don't let any circumstance break your spirit. I have a feeling that this woman that came was broken. She, she was in pain. She needed her Savior. Now, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption. We shouldn't do this, okay? But I'm going to make a little, uh, 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 just this is me thinking out loud, okay? She was broken in her heart. But had she not followed through in her obedience to the Lord, could she have had a broken spirit? I don't know. I, I, I don't know that. The Bible's not clear. But it makes me think, if she had not followed through, could she have just uh, given in to a broken spirit? And, and could that apply to you and me? Maybe your heart's broken. Maybe my heart's broken. And, and we feel that we should come and pour ourselves out before the Lord, and we say, ah, no, nah, forget it. No, I'm not going to do that. If we don't do that, could we be bordering a broken spirit? where it takes the wind out of our sails because God says that's a devastating thing and don't let it happen. You see, when you have a broken spirit, you want to give up. You want to throw in the towel and you say things like this. I can't do it anymore. I'm done. I'm finished. I'm, I'm, I'm through with this. And that's exactly what the devil wants you and me to think because then you'll forget who you are in Christ Jesus. And he said that I have called you to be victorious and to be an overcomer. So if you've got a broken heart, and you hear a pastor like me saying, you are victorious, and you are an overcomer, but you're hearing it, and you're saying, I don't feel like it. That's why we don't go by feelings. We go by faith. And when you go by faith, faith says that you are an overcomer, 
And though you are broken, God is with you. He will heal you. He will get you through whatever season you're going through right now. And he will redeem this time, whatever that time is for you. Here's the, here's the fourth thing I want you to write down that, that you and I need to do when we face a broken spirit or we have a broken heart. Number four, set your heart on that which cannot be broken. Set your heart on that which cannot be broken. Psalms 119 verse 6 says this, Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all of your commandments. Uh, you're not going to be put to shame. When? When your eyes are fixed on all his commandments. You know when we experience shame? When our eyes are not fixed on all his commandments. When we do the things that we know we shouldn't do, that's when we experience shame. But here's the very cool thing about God. The cool thing is this. When you find times when you've gotten your eyes off of him and you've not followed his commands, it says that he is just and faithful to forgive us of all of our sins. So if you find yourself in that place where you're like, hey, I, know, I understand the shame, I understand not having my eyes fixed, you can do something about that today. And you can say yes to Jesus, and you can set your heart now on that which cannot be broken. And that's the cross tree of Calvary. Because that's where Jesus was headed. You know, we are to set our eyes on Jesus and keep our eyes fixed on him forever. And this helps us to not suffer a broken heart or a broken spirit. And it helps us to stay strong. Verse 9 in this story that we've been talking about ends with this. Jesus says that the woman, it says the woman came in, broke the flask, anointed his feet. She was criticized. And Jesus said, hey, stop. Leave her alone. Because she's done something that, that y'all ain't even thinking about, all right? She's anointing my body. She's preparing me. She's doing something she knows needs to be done that you're not aware of. And then he ends it by saying this in verse 9. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Imagine being that woman, scared, worried, fearful, yet she goes in and gives something of value, all that she had. And then Jesus says, for the rest of eternity, wherever this story is told, your name's going to be told. You see, this woman had a choice to make. And, and the question is, why honor her? Here's the answer, because she honored the Lord. She was willing to honor the Lord. When you set your heart on that which cannot be broken, which is Jesus, even when you walk through brokenness, you honor him with your whole life, God will lift you up, and he will heal your brokenness. But be careful, because the enemy is going to try to get your eyes off of God, because he doesn't want us to lean into that. He doesn't want us focused on the right thing. He wants us focused on the wrong thing. He wants us to not understand that we can be an overcomer. So what, what are we supposed to do? We must treasure Jesus more than any relationship, more than any promotion, more than any dream in the world because that is the most valuable thing. You know, the enemy wants to, to get our eyes fixed on the wrong thing. I, you know, I'm going to tell the story and uh, um, he wants our eyes fixed on the wrong thing. I remember my daughter when she was young, and she may want to slug me in the arm after I tell the story, but I remember when she would go to the store, she had, she had this knack for, for getting away from whoever it was that she was with, mom, dad, her aunt, her uncle. She loved to go and just kind of walk to the store and hide. And, uh, of course, as parents, we're not really feeling that, right? Because you'd be walking with your daughter, then all of a sudden she disappears. And it scares you. Where's my daughter at? And you're afraid somebody abducted her or what's going on? And I remember she went shopping with my, my sister Dawn one time. And one of the things my daughter loved was gum. She loved chewing gum. And so my, my sister gave her a piece of gum, and she was chewing on that gum. But she decided to play hide-and-seek in a specific store. And she hid in one of the clothing racks. Well, then my sister couldn't find her. Of course, panic set into her heart and into her life because she's thinking, oh, no, I just lost my brother's kid. They're going to kill me, right? And she was looking all over for Drea. Here, Drea was hiding in the clothes rack, and she thought it was the funniest thing, and she had this twisted, evil little laugh as she giggled about it until my sister said, Drea, that wasn't funny. The gum I gave you was something I gave you because you were being good. And she took her to the bathroom to correct her. She said, now give me your gum. And Drea had to spit out her gum in the hand, and my sister threw it in the bathroom and then proceeded to use the bathroom. And as she used the bathroom, my daughter started to cry. And as she cried, Dawn couldn't figure out why, my sister couldn't figure out why she was crying. And she said, honey, why are you crying? And 
Dr. A looked back with, uh, with a broken heart and said, because Aunt Doe, you just peed on my gum and her heart was so broken over the wrong thing, right? Do you know how many times you and I cry over the wrong thing? You see, she could have been lost. And I think about Jesus, how he came and he tried to bring salvation to a world who all they could care about was the fun around them and hiding here and hiding there, not realizing they could have been lost for an eternity. Yet Jesus came to give us life and life abundantly. And there's times where Jesus will say, give me your gum. I blessed you, but you've not handled it well. And you may feel at times like somebody peed on your gum, but I'll tell you this. You need to understand that God wants to bless you abundantly. And when you're going through brokenness in life, know this, as you lean into him, and as you trust the Lord with all that you have, and you set your heart on that which cannot be broken, you will find that Jesus will not only redeem that which was once broken, but he will create something brand new that he will use. He will work in you and through you because this is what it's all about, folks, when we celebrate Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. It's not just because it's a holiday throughout the year. It's about a Savior who not only came but knew while, why he was coming. So while everyone celebrated on Palm Sunday and they started to lay down the branches, Hosanna in the highest, they shouted. Hosanna in the highest, they sang because they thought he was going to be their new redeemer in the physical realm. Jesus knew not only what it meant to be broken, but he knew the brokenness he was going to have to go through. And he did it for you and for me so that when we're walking through our brokenness, we can know that God understands. Jesus, he cares. God cares. Jesus understands. And his heart is bigger than ours. And when we set our hearts on him, Jesus will show us the most valuable thing in brokenness is being at the feet of Jesus, just like this woman. You see, how do you bring all your desires into submission and into alignment? Well, it's simply by making Jesus your greatest desire. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to be weird. He, folks, can I tell you this? Becoming a Christian doesn't mean that you have to become something you're not already. You're just asking him to be a part of it, to lead you. He, Yes, he wants to redeem you. Yes, he wants to create something new within you, but he likes who you are. Otherwise, he wouldn't have created you the way he did. He wants to be a part of your life. You just simply have to make the greatest desire Jesus in your life. And when Jesus is your greatest desire, guess what? Other desires start to fade away. The things that, that once ruled your life, you know, how can I let them go? When Jesus is your greatest desire, the other things just fall to the side. When you and I make Jesus our greatest desire, then we will experience the heart of Jesus. We will be stewards of his blessings. We will be stewards also, though, of his tears as well. And when you and I go through a broken heart, we'll be able to heal quickly. We won't have to suffer a broken spirit. We may go through broken hearts. Maybe you're going through a season right now where the job you have is not the job you thought you were going to end up with. You want something better. You want something different, and you're struggling. Trust the Lord right where you're at, please, and watch what God is going to do. And when you go through these seasons in life, God will do something fresh and new. All of us, by the way, all of us will experience a broken heart because we're in a broken-hearted world. But we serve and love a God who can redeem a broken heart. Amen, church? We, we, we serve that kind of a Savior. And he can bring that redemption to you and to me and to everyone around us. But we must allow him to heal our heart today. Are you going through a season of brokenness? I challenge you, don't fear the brokenness. Let the brokenness draw you closer to God. Let him be the one that heals you. And let your heart become like his. In Jesus' name. I want to pray for you today as we prepare to close. And simply ask, that I'm going to pray for two things, okay? The first is this. I want to pray, if you're listening today and you're going through a, a season of brokenness, I want to pray that God will come in a unique way, right where you're at. And he will heal you. He will fill your heart with peace and with hope. And I'm going to ask that the Lord will come in that unique way and move in your life. But then I'm going to ask this. Maybe you're watching online. Uh, you're sharing through YouTube or Facebook or some other technology I'm not aware of. And you're in a place where you've not made that decision to follow Jesus. I, I want to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. It's not hard. It's very simple. And I'm going to lead you through that prayer. But I want to start by just saying, first of all, Jesus, as we come and prepare our hearts before you, Lord, I ask that you would come for each and every one of us that are experiencing brokenness today. 
and that, Lord, you will meet us where we're at and heal our hearts. Lord, your word has said that you are near those who are brokenhearted. So, Lord, I'm asking today for each and every person that is going through a season of brokenness right now, uh, no matter what degree or level, that you will come and meet them where they're at. And that, Lord God, you will reveal yourself. And that, Lord, in the middle of their brokenness, Lord, I ask that you'd fill it with the presence and with the power of your Holy Spirit. And that you will heal their hearts. And that, Lord, even though they may still feel broken, that they will know that you are here healing them right now in the name of Jesus. And that where they are will not be the same place they will be tomorrow because you're going to heal them and they're going to grow from this. So, Father, we trust you in the middle of all of this. And I want to ask this, secondly, if you're listening online uh, and you've not made that decision for Jesus and you want to, can I just say first and foremost, I, I hope that you take this decision seriously and you place it as the highest priority because there is a God. I've told people this before. People say, how do you know for sure there's a God? How do you know Jesus is real? And, and I just try to bring a little reality check and say this. Um, if I am right and there is a Jesus, then there's, this is the only uh, hell I'm ever going to experience. But, um, but if, if you're right and, and you say, you know what, I don't believe in Jesus, but, but you decide not to make a decision and you find out when that day comes that there really is a God and you missed out, don't miss out. He wants the best for you and for me. For those who don't have a relationship with Jesus, uh, earth is the only heaven you're going to experience. But for those of us that have said yes to Jesus, guess what? Earth is the only hell that we'll ever experience because he's got an eternity for you and for me. Are you listening today and you want to say yes to Jesus? Then I'm going to ask you to just pray with me. And I'm asking you to just repeat after me and say, Jesus, come into my heart and into my life and be my Savior. Go ahead and say that to him. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I'm asking you today to be my Savior. Redeem my life. I ask today in Jesus' name and be the Lord of my life. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me tell you something. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it, the Bible says that, that when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that, that then you're saved. It says that when you ask him to come in and forgive you, it's a done deal. You've received Jesus into your heart. You might say, I still feel the same. Nothing miraculous has happened. Oh, yes, it has in the invisible spiritual, and it will break through in the, vi in the visible physical. You'll see God show up in your life. And if you're going through a season of brokenness today, know this, church family, we are praying for you. We love you. And as we go through this, se this series called Broken, I, I want you to just keep your hearts open to see what God wants to show us in these next few weeks because it's in the middle of the brokenness that we maybe face the greatest challenges, but we also learn the greatest lessons in life. So continue to watch us. Check out our website uh, at kotod.church and know that we're going to be sharing information. Again, if you're looking to give in your tithes and offerings, you can do it at the website. Um, if you need help with that, let us know. You can call the church office or swing swing by here just as long as it's under 10 people and we are going to continue to communicate with you about how we will be doing church we love you church family god bless you